Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I am Prakash Dasgupta from London. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Society of Robotic Surgery uh, future uh, session. And uh, this session is going to focus on the role of imaging and uh, image guidance. I'm joined by three experts who I will introduce to you one by one. Uh, and also by my friend and colleague, uh, Raj Nair, also a robotic surgeon uh, from London. To uh, kick off this uh, session, we have uh, Christos Bergelis. Uh, Christos is uh, a very well-known uh, imaging scientist and biomedical engineer uh, from King's College London at the St. Thomas's Hospital site. Uh, Christos, over to you. We look forward to listening to you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, Prokar. Thank you very much for, for having me. I am pleased to share uh, uh, my um, uh, research expertise on, on the topic. Uh, uh, do you, you're seeing my slides all right, I suppose, right? Okay, so um, I will talk about surgical robotics and surgical data science, and specifically the role that imaging should have in uh, bringing these two disciplines together. Uh, I am with King's College London. I lead the Robotics and Vision Medicine Lab within the School of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences. What is key to discuss, in my opinion, before embarking on a discussion of where we should go, is where is surgical robotics, uh, where did it come from? So. If we look at these three systems, uh, these are very notable systems, at least in the engineering community. So perhaps the, 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 the practitioners community is not familiar with them, but Probot was one of the first systems ever designed for robotic surgery. It was developed at Imperial College London and then uh, evaluated already in a clinical trial at uh, St. Thomas's and uh, GSTT Trust. It was aiming to do prostate interventions and it was uh, uh, operating fully autonomously under a pre-operative plan. ESOP was a system designed in the United States. It was meant to hold the endoscope during laparoscopic interventions. And RoboDoc was one of the first systems designed for <clears throat> orthopedic surgery. Now, the notable characteristic of these systems, which is why I am picking them out, is that they all operated by receiving images. So there was visual information either in terms of a preoperative plan or intraoperative imaging like ultrasound or endoscopic images. But none of these systems have any capacity to react on the images. And uh, specifically, Probot had a stop button should something go out of plan. Now, if we fast forward to the marvels of today, and uh, this, the example is the Da Vinci system that everybody is using, this is a fantastic system in terms of like engineering innovation, in terms of, of polishing, of the precision that it can offer, in terms of what it can allow you as surgeons to do. Because in our opinion, it can enhance surgical dexterity and it can give you this added uh, bonus in terms of uh, the abilities to, to carry out very complex tasks. But is it really a smart device? Um, it acquires images, but again, there is no feedback in terms of what these images are supposed to be interpreted by. So you as a surgeon uh, are interpreting these images, but the robot has no intelligence whatsoever. So there is a perception part, but there is no cognition part. And this is the loop that we're trying to explore. And this is what we're trying to push the innovation. Can we create better surgical robotic systems, but can these systems be cognitive and fit within an operating theater that is also smart and able to carry out decision support for the surgeons? So we see innovation in surgical robotics in three key pillars. The first pillar is, of course, robotic systems research and robotic systems engineering. Can we design better systems? Can we find niche applications that current companies are not looking at without this diminishing the impact that they could have for humanity? Can we start interpreting the images that the robots themselves have? Can we bring multimodal information to the game, different spectrums, pre-operative images, can we see the invisible? This is key in surgical robotics if we want to increase the precision of surgery. And can we bring multimodal sensing information together with the information that surgical robotic systems themselves have in the paradigm of surgical data science in order to be able to go towards autonomous systems, towards semi-autonomous interventions, where the robot is not only a mechanical slave that 
that responds to commands by the surgeon, but an entity that is able to come in with its own ability to interpret what it is seeing. <clears throat> In order to approach this, 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 this problem holistically, we have founded the Department of Surgical and Interventional Engineering within King's College London. And really we are bringing three key scientific components together. The aspects of precision instrumentation, which is what somebody would consider as classical robots. The aspects of physiological navigation, which is really all the imaging and multimodal information that comes into play in order to be able to get better decisions during surgery. And finally, the important component of clinician experience. Because what we have found time and time again is that engineers are experts on creating new systems, but unless they fit well within the clinical workflow, they won't be adopted. And we are coupling these three components, the robotics, as I said, uh, the development of new sensors for uh, uh, delivering implants in the body, uh, developing new microtechnology, for example, to understand what forces are being exerted by surgical instruments on the, on the body, uh, new surgical interfaces and new simulated experiences in order to understand whether different tactile perception, for example, would make difference or not, but now in a simulated setting, preoperative planning, and then advanced intraoperative navigation algorithms that will bring all the different information together in one single framework that would uh, achieve uh, a better surgery. Now, if I am to pin down uh, some of these components of this research a little bit more in depth, I would start by robotic systems engineering. Now, yes, Da Vinci is a system that is out there, but there are so many different systems that have been explored and are being explored by all parts of the academic and industrial community. And this would range from steerable catheters uh, to steerable needles to MRI compatible robots that are actuated by shape memory alloys to micro machines that go under the heart in order to, 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 to detach different membranes and uh, uh, deliver drugs there to micro robots that are navigating the human body in order to deliver drugs to capsule endoscopes that are able to perform biopsies and interventions in situ and even to magnetotactic bacteria that are actuated under MRI guidance in order to deliver drugs at deep-seated tumor locations. Now, what is important here to realize is that in order to achieve those, what the engineering community should do is to closely talk to the surgical practitioners and understand the requirements of the discipline and incorporate the imaging information in the, uh, within the, the pipeline of those systems in order to uh, achieve a better uh, clinical decision making. Now, what we do in my lab is we are looking at these uh, three aspects that I previously discussed uh, in an end-to-end -end pipeline. So we start by designing our systems, but rather than looking more only at what can we scientifically do, we're trying to develop systems that are primarily able to suit, to fit within current surgical workflows. So even though my background is, is in ophthalmology and vitroretinal surgery and regenerative therapy delivery is what uh, primarily funds my research, what I am saying applies throughout the disciplines of robotic surgery. So we need to go and understand the operating room. We need to model where the patient is, what the surgical table is, where are the nurses, what are the different obstacles? How can I wheel in the robot in the operating theater? Because if I design a system that requires five people in order to put together and operate, then this will never uh, reach clinical adoption. Yes, one could argue that this is the, the side that the industry should be undertaking, but the reality is that all these constraints that the operating room poses and that the clinical applications impose, this is what drives science ahead. So what we are doing within my team is we're looking at every different aspect, every different part of the robot and understanding how everything behaves, coming up with advanced models and coming up then with the link between this advanced robotic instrumentation and imaging in order to be able to guide the robot and support the clinician in carrying out tasks. So precision instrumentation, in other words, allows you to do impossible interventions to improve dexterity but also seeing and sensing the invisible through advanced sensors like photoacoustics, uh, like uh, 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 ultrasound from the tip of fibers, uh, like uh, um, hyperspectral imaging, and link those together to prevent the unthinkable. And this latter part of preventing the unthinkable and seeing the invisible, this is where surgical data science comes in play. 
because yes, one thing is to provide all this information, but then we will have information overload from the side of the practitioners. And this is where surgical data science comes in play. Are we able to distill all this information that we can now gather through imaging, uh, through workflow analysis, through 110 notes on the outcomes of surgery, through all these different uh, uh, modalities that all come together in the operating room. This is one example that has been studied extensively uh, from the team at King's uh, on the surgical steps for spina bifida surgery. And what you can see is that one needs to go and understand schematically where is everybody seated in the operating room? Where is space for the robotic systems? How would another player come and interact with everything? What are the different steps of surgery? Where do different instruments come in? What are the imaging modalities? And then surgical data science will tease out what are the most crucial parts of the intervention? Where are the bottlenecks? What should the robot come in and do? What do we need in terms of advanced images? Where are the drawbacks? And so what surgical data science allows us to do is if we treat the operating room as a massive, massive um, tank of information, can we come in and start understanding patterns in that information and proposing changes in the workflow that could be of benefit? Now, what is important to understand and perhaps could justify why some of these uh, have not yet reached clinical practice is that in, surgical, uh, in the surgical domain, there is no ImageNet. ImageNet is uh, a collection of several millions of images that have been painstakingly annotated uh, in, from, 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 from humans, and they all uh, show cars and dogs and cats and natural scenes. So very simple to understand objects with lots of rigor in providing classifications and segmentations of what everything is. Now this is impossible to do in surgery. Every surgical application is different. Every patient is different. And there are so many irregularities in the images that are being acquired. And this is just one example from vitroretinal surgery again. You have tools, you have shadows, you have blurry images, you have glare, you have compression artifacts because of the videos, you have uh, particles floating around. In the cases of you know, laparoscopic surgery, you would have blood, you would have smoke, you have occlusions, you have all these additional things, which you can't just filter out and say, I'll be just focusing on a very clean part of surgery, because this, this just removes all the fun from it. So one approach potentially that we could take is to try and synthesize our old data. And what we are doing in my team is we are trying to use the domain knowledge that we have to create the data. For example, a surgical scene is composed of various layers. It would be the tissue, it would be the tools in front of the tissue, and then it would be a field of view afterwards. Can we bring this domain knowledge and synthesize the image transformations and create videos that are partially real and partially synthetic and then use these synthesized videos that we have perfect knowledge of, like we know exactly where our field of view are, we know exactly the motions that we apply, we know exactly where our tools are. So can we use this synthetic data that we have perfect knowledge of and then train our neural networks to perform on real surgical scenes? And this combination of training on synthetic data and then uh, perhaps fine tuning on real surgical cases, this is what will allow us to use an, a huge amount of data and carry out uh, tasks within actual clinical settings rather than only toy examples. So what we have managed to do is to track surgical targets within scenes that are rather noisy and blurry and with specularities and out of focus. And we are looking to apply these algorithms now uh, in, in prostate surgery and use this tracking of the images, not only to understand where a target is and whether I could guide the robot to a resection there or whether I could track anatomical landmarks and perhaps regions of interest and importance, but can I use now the image, the video information that has been captured during surgery to predict what will happen next. If a tool is moving next, what will happen? What is the next surgical phase? How should the robot preempt the action of the surgeon? And perhaps this is where some sort of autonomy will come in play because if the robot predicts that something wrong is about to happen, maybe it could apply some feedback to the surgeon to restrain it. So to summarize, it's not just the image that we could use, but everything within the operating theater. So we're looking at something like an internet of things for the operating room. And we are creating an, a mock operating theater at King's, which we will, we will sensorize. And we will incorporate the large scale imaging, 
the precision instrumentation and tracking everything that is happening. Uh, we will be monitoring the location of people, the location of patients, and try to understand what we can do to intervene in the workflow and what sort of advanced information needs to come in uh, in order to, to, to increase the performance of surgeons and support them in decision making. So I gave you an overview of where I feel the surgical robotics field is going and how it links with surgical data science and advanced imaging. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll be looking forward to taking any questions. Thank you very much. Christos, uh, this was absolutely uh, masterful as an overview of where we are with uh, video labeling, uh, building in so many technical capabilities into an operating uh, theater as we are about to do as part of our MedTech Hub. The question is, um, how, what sort of error uh, do you think a surgeon uh, could expect from uh, this kind of technology? What is acceptable in vitreo retinal surgery, for example? Yes, so in the context of vitreo retinal surgery, uh, the errors already are very small. And this is something that must be constantly highlighted to us engineers because we are missing it. So in vitreo retinal surgery, in conventional surgery, you can have high success rates on the order of 90 to 95%. And then the remaining 5% is just surgeries that would go wrong in the sense that there was a problem with physiology or the patient somehow didn't respond well. So it's not necessarily surgical error. So what we really need to look as engineers working within academic environments is what is currently what cannot be done. Because if we try to focus on what cannot be done, then we will naturally have a benefit. So if, if I tell you to resect a tumor in the prostate, then you can do this routinely with like very, very good success rates. And What's the point in doing it? But if I can highlight these very, very tough cases that normally you wouldn't do, then we would have a very high margin of error for the algorithm, but still it would be better than can be done right now. And this is really the paradigm that we're looking at. I would absolutely love a margin rate as close to zero as possible. And uh, uh, currently in T3 tumors, one third of patients have a positive margin. If I was a patient, I'd be very disappointed actually. Mm -hmm having had high-tech surgery, have a 30%, 35% margin rate. So that's where I am hoping you will come in uh, and actually uh, make a direct benefit to cancer patients. I know Raj has a question. Raj, over to you. Yes, I mean, first of all, Christos, a fantastic talk and really congratulations on the work you're doing. Um, one of the things about neural networks is that they require quite a lot more data than just traditional machine learning algorithms. and that data, particularly in surgery, is vast. Number one, you need a huge number of operations. Number two, you need to account for variability in uh, anatomy. And number three, different surgeons operate in different styles. How do you get around this problem when you are looking at trying to even focus on the mi most minute sort of complex maneuver, whatever it is, you know, that's just part of a, a huge series of events. And, yeah. you know, how, how do you get around that? And how do you store all this data? Yeah, this is a very good question. And this is fundamentally, I think, the difference that the surgical domain poses in comparison to uh, natural images, certainly. But I would argue generally medical image analysis when you're looking at MRI scans or uh, how do you get around this? So, so I think the data is out there. I think at St. Thomas, you have thousands and thousands of recorded video surgeries. The challenge is how do you curate this data and make them into a, an accessible format? And this is where, you know, you don't need to go to the end machine learning, to the final thing, but if you create mini machine learning modules that could, let's say, separate the data or into ones that are usable and ones that are not, or low quality or high quality, then you can start making sense of your data. Now, in my viewpoint, what, what I think the ultimate way that this would work is you train your algorithms through the vast data you have in a combination between supervised and unsupervised fashion, but then you have a module that as you start to perform surgery, it learns on the fly. So you have something that gets adapted to the specific patient, to the specific setting, and to the specific surgeon on the fly. And, and and I think this is really the only way. I don't think you can have a turnkey solution in surgery for everything. But if you can have something that lies, is at 80% intelligence, and then during surgery progressively it learns, and then when you reach the hardest bit, 
it knows what it's supposed to know because it has adapted, then this could be beneficial. That is uh, fantastic. Uh, let's uh, carry on with the excitement and uh, uh, move on to a very, very exciting uh, topic, which is uh, 3D printing. Uh, I have the pleasure in introducing to you uh, Pankaj Chandak, uh, who really is a pioneering uh, 3D uh, printing surgeon, has made a very significant contribution to the field. Uh, and over to you, Panku, uh, to tell us about 3D printing uh, and your experience of that in surgical science. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? To great. Well, many thanks, uh, Professor Dasgupta, for the kind introduction um, and also the opportunity to speak at this very exciting congress. Um, I'm a uh, transplant surgical trainee and a research fellow at King's, and I'll be talking about the use of 3D printing in surgery and illustrating this with some examples from my own speciality in transplantation uh, and touching on uh, its use in robotics and also in some aspects of urology. Um, before I uh, start, I would just like to pay tribute to the father of 3D printing, uh, Charles Hull. Um, now, 3D printing is not a new technology as such. It's been around for 40 years and really developed by Charles Hull in the 1980s when he was experimenting with how to harden tablecloth with UV light. Um, and since then it's been used in almost all sorts of industrial applications and in fact only recently uh, you can probably see the photo there on the right I was involved in helping 3D print some PPE during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic times with the eye maker company in a factory. Uh, which also opened my eyes into the use of 3D printing in industry as well. Um, however, in the medical world, its use has been mostly in the realms of um, orthopedic surgery and maxillofacial surgery and congenital cardiac surgery um, for the use of pre-planning uh, complex procedures. Um, and what I would like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to demonstrate really its emerging use in aspects of complex pediatric transplantation uh, robotics and neurology. So let's just think about complex pediatric transplantation. Um, one of the challenges that we have is trying to implant an adult-sized kidney into a small child. Um, and essentially we're faced with two challenges. The first is the size discrepancy between the adult organ, which is usually from mum or dad, and the small pediatric abdomen. And by small I mean less than 20 kilograms. Are we able to close the abdomen? How is this going to affect the pressure inside, um, which, which may affect the blood flow in the organ? And indeed, how is it going to affect the ventilation of the child? And indeed, almost 20% of adult-sized kidneys are discarded because of size mismatch to a pediatric uh, small uh, recipient. So that's a significant number. The second problem we're faced with is that a lot of these children are born with uh, complex congenital anomalies of their blood vessels. In the normal situation, if a child is less than 20 kilograms, we place the kidney onto the aorta and vena cava directly. Um, but sometimes you're faced with this situation. And here is an example of a child who is six years old, weighing 18 kilograms, who actually, you can probably see here, um, has had a, well, he was born with a congenital abdominal aortic aneurysm and had a supraceliac to aortic bifurcation, plastic graft put in, PTFE graft with a reimplantation of the, of the visceral vessels. And as transplant says, we have to navigate our way around this to try and find a landing zone in which we can anastomose the new blood vessels of the kidney onto. So you can see we're trying to interpret a three-dimensional structure in a 2D computer screen. And indeed, that's one of the limitations, if you like, of conventional medical imaging, 
Um, most of our cases are discussed in a complex multidisciplinary team uh, full of radiologists, uh, surgeons, intensivists, and pediatric nephrologists. And it, and it relies on a radiologist to interpret the imaging and communicate that interpretation to the multidisciplinary team. What we cannot do is interact with those images, um, simulate any procedures, uh, and indeed it lacks tactile interaction. And in our most complex cases, when the feasibility of a transplant cannot be determined based on these uh, two uh, D computer screen uh, interpretations, uh, we often have to perform surgical exploration of a child before taking the kidney out of mom or dad. Um, and as you can imagine, that's quite a stressful situation for both the donor team and the implanting team, um, and the child is um, under anesthesia for a long time. So the idea for 3D printing in pediatric transplantation in our unit was to really predict feasibility in the presence of complexity um, when, when faced with a challenging transplant in a child. And so we had a stepwise approach. We wanted to do a proof of concept can we actually 3D print an adult uh, a kidney and can we actually 3D print the, the child's abdomen and confirm geometrical correlation? And then the next step was to perform clinical translation by assessing the technology prospectively in complex living donor pediatric kidney transplants in cases where the feasibility was uncertain. This shows uh, the workflow screen. Essentially, uh, relevant anatomical data is extracted um, from CT scans and MR scans. And this process is called image segmentation. And what we do is then develop this computer-aided design, this STL file, where, and we use Mimic software to then produce a three-dimensional model. Um, and, and essentially what happens is that the 3D printer, which is here, this is our 3D printer, which is in uh, St. Thomas's Department of Medical Physics. It's a object 500 connects one printer. It essentially molds UV, uh, liquid plastic resin um, under UV light and forms a morphological shape over about 12 hours or so. And we can print things in hard materials and soft materials, um, and you can see the materials uh, there that we use. So that's the standard approach that we use for um, our 3D printed uh, models. And here's an example of image segmentation of a cardiac uh, case. This is a, um, um, a congenitally uh, malformed heart. And you can see the uh, process of extracting the anatomical data. Um, um, and this is actually quite labor intensive. This is where the time uh, and the precision is needed with radiologists, medical physics team, and the clinical team. And it forms this design here. And here you can see um, the printer head, which then molds liquid plastic resin, if you like, um, under UV light to form a morphological shape um, over about 12 hours. But it can be longer depending on the complexity of the organ that we're trying to print. So this slide here um, shows the, um, our patient-specific workflow uh, based on the proof of concept case. Um, and this was the case that you saw earlier of the six-year-old child who had the um, a plastic graft put in um, to replace her aorta. And she actually underwent a successful transplant without 3D printing. So we wanted to test it retrospectively. And as you can see, the, um, the, the, the CAD designs here are acquired from routine medical images. Um, and then the 3D model is printed here and showed good geometrical correlation. And we also showed it to five independent surgeons who confirmed this value of the preoperative planning tool. And in fact, um, what we then did was a performed surgical manipulation, uh, which aided, if you like, um, understanding and deliberation of the anatomy. And in fact, you can see here, this is the kidney from mom, and this is the artery here. And we actually found on the model, a small space here in which to um, connect this vessel to this vessel here. Um, and, um, before um, uh, this model was printed, as I said, the case was done without 3D printing. This, this whole process just to find this um, suitable spot took almost three hours, which, uh, which, which is a long time before the transplant is even uh, properly uh, begun. We then want to confirm validation. So is the printer reproducing the data file that we're actually putting in? Um, so what we did here was uh, we CT scanned some of the models, produced um, an SDL file from that CT scan, and compared it to the original SDL file that we put in uh, into the software. And what, how we did this was we drew down um, the vascular tree, we produced the center line, and we compared the diameter at different points along the center line between the two SDL files. And what we showed was the diameter of the printed model is smaller than the original file by about 0.1 of a millimeter, comparing favorably, if you like, within the limits of surgical precision. So essentially, the diameter is captured in the input files and it's well produced by the 3D printer. We then wanted to perform clinical translation of this, and we used this in three specific clinical scenarios um, in pediatric transplantation. The first is a small pediatric recipient. 
The second case is a two-stage procedure, and the third case was a small pediatric recipient, but quite complex vascular abnormalities. And I'll just very quickly take you through those three cases. So this is the first case, the small pediatric recipient. This is uh, Lucy, and she was only 10 kilograms at the time of the transplant, two years old, had quite a lot of extensive abdominal surgery prior to her transplant for bowel ischemia. We were worried about scarring and adhesions. And she was getting a kidney from her father, Chris, which was uh, the right kidney. And you can see the geometrical correlations there between the images, the CAD design, and the models themselves. And this is what we printed in the end. You can see the size discrepancy between the kidney and Lucy's abdomen. This is the liver, this is the pelvis. And interestingly, the printer had the ability to print the pelvis in a hard material, um, a bit like bone, and then these um, tissues in, in softer material. It's not exactly like human um, uh, tissue properties, but it's, uh, it's fairly close. And, um, and, and we were quite uh, impressed with that because it gives us the defined borders of the cavity that we need to place the kidney into. And there's the, uh, uh, the vena cava there, and there's that we also in the two native kidneys there. And this just shows um, a video of Professor Mahmoud, who, uh, who was using the models prior to the operation. And it shows how we use the models. Um, so essentially, you can see him lining up the blood vessels of the donor kidney uh, to the blood vessels of uh, Lucy's uh, abdomen. It gave us an indication of whether we needed to mobilize the liver in order to create space. Um, and it also gave us a, a, an understanding of depth perception which is um, quite hard to appreciate on a two-dimensional computer screen. And indeed, whether we needed to take out Lucy's right kidney, you can see him pointing to that there, the size of a walnut in order to create space. The model told us perhaps we didn't need to do that. Of course, that's a decision that we would normally take at the time of surgery. Um, and you can see um, how the kidney's going to sit inside the abdomen um, and also alert us to space issues if needed and the line of incision. There's the kidney at reperfusion. Um, and um, our vascular dimensions also correlated quite closely with the model. The second procedure we did was, uh, uh, the second case that we did was a two-stage procedure. So this was a child, 12 kilograms, who had bilateral renal artery aneurysms and an IMA aneurysm. And the first stage was to remove both of these dysplastic kidneys, which also had renal artery aneurysms in. Again, 3D planning uh, was undertaken. And here you can see on this photograph, um, of the left hyla vessel from a posterior retroperitoneal approach with the lines of transection marked um, quite clearly. And this follows quite nicely with the laparoscopic pictures here showing vascular configuration consistency with what was predicted on the model. And the child underwent bilateral nephrectomy successfully. And then a month later, um, underwent a living donor transplant from um, her mother. You can see, um, again, the size discrepancy between the adult donor living kidney and the blood vessels of the child. Um, and indeed, this child also had an IMA aneurysm. So we planned where we were going to transect the aneurysm at the neck on the model, and also planned our anastomosis uh, landing zones on the um, IVC and aorta, and the child had a successful outcome. Um, the last case that we used the 3D printing was uh, in, was in uh, abdominal vascular abnormalities. Um, as I mentioned, these children can be born with um, vessels that, that are either blocked, missing, narrowed, or twisted. And this can affect both the arterial system and the venous system and can complicate our implantation uh, approach. Um, and here's a child, 14 kilograms, female, and she was born with quite a high aortic bifurcation with a complete trouser leg configuration, if you like, of her, um, of her common iliacs. You can see that there. Uh, when we presented this case to our multidisciplinary team, um, the surgeons were uh, divisive in their opinions as to the feasibility of the implant. 50% um, said this is not possible, another 50% said this could be possible. We 3D printed it um, and brought the model back to the NDM um, and 100% feasibility was confirmed with the surgical team. Um, it was taken to the operating theatre, we identified our uh, landing uh, zones for our anastomosis, anastomosis and this correlated very well with the intraoperative findings here. So there's the IVC um, and there's the aorta there with the bifurcation, you can see that there and the child had a successful outcome, again, um, which couldn't have been predicted without um, the model, really. So that's how we used it in pediatric transplantation. Just changing tack slightly now, we're going to think about robotic-assisted kidney transplants. And indeed, um, our group performed um, the UK's first um, robotic-assisted kidney transplant back in 2016, uh, led by Professor Mahmoud and Professor Modi from India. And this then prompted us to think about how we can use 3D printing in this environment, um, especially for training. And this is some uh, innovative work led by uh, my colleague, Yanis Lokopoulos at Guys. It's uh, essentially creating a hybrid model of human vessels and 3D printing. 
um, because at all times we're trying to recreate, um, if you like, the operative environment to as realistic um, limitations as possible. So let me just take you through this video very quickly of how this works, um, the training. So we 3D print a life-sized human kidney. We 3D print a pelvis, the recipient pelvis. And what we do is keep gaps in deliberately in the blood vessels here. These are the, uh, the iliacs. There's the position of uh, the kidney, the transplant. And what we do, we create serrated edges um, in the actual vessels. Um, and then we do our hybrid model assembly. And what we're doing here is attaching cadaveric banked blood vessels, uh, common iliac vessels, um, into the gaps, if you like, um, to recreate, if you like, um, 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 the blood vessel, um, the vascular integrity. And then we stitch those in place. We place the whole stack underneath the robotic uh, arms. And you can see the artery here attached to the uh, donor renal artery and the vein attached to the donor renal uh, vein. And then we uh, undertake a simulated uh, 3D arterial and venous anastomosis. Uh, and we time ourselves um, as to how efficiently and quickly we can do this um, because of the importance of the warm ischemia time um, in this. And this is a real robotic case. Um, uh, with the arterial anastomosis taking place. You can see that there. And ideally, we need to try and do this within about 40 minutes. Um, and you can see um, a similar approach here on the uh, 3D uh, printed uh, hybrid model. So this is, we found a very useful tool for training um, and to improve your um, anastomosis time. And it's being uh, further validated now in uh, more cases. We're also uh, looking at this uh, technology in the use of uh, 3D um, uh, printing for robotic prostatectomy led by um, Professor Das Gupta. Um, and we looked at 10 cases with localized T3 prostate cancer in 3D uh, printed a prostate here. You can see the tumor just uh, delineated here. And uh, what we found in our initial work was that uh, the model provided useful tactile feedback to the surgeon and indeed appreciation of that critical anatomy in preserving the neurovascular bundles and the sphincter in relation to the tumour. And uh, this will be uh, next tested in a larger uh, trial, but with encouraging uh, um, initial pilot results. So just to conclude, really, what have we learned so far from uh, our experience? Well, we've learned that 3D models um, provide a few sessions of anatomy. They are easy to understand for the surgical team and the multidisciplinary team and to translate clinically. Um, we, they allow surgery to be simulated with improved hands-on planning. And I think the really important point is um, they also aid the personalized consent process for the families because the models are specific to them. They're not um, a generic model from, um, 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 from a factory, for example. And therefore, um, that's quite important in developing a rapport with the family, especially when you're performing cases that are generally quite rare and you cannot quantify the risk. Um, and I think it helps families understand um, the technicality of the process and what's expected. And also it helps children um, um, actually appreciate um, the importance of transplantation and compliance with medication for immunosuppression. Um, importantly, as we've already alluded to, um, you can develop an archive collection of things for future, future surgeons because these models actually have inherent pathological an um, anatomy depicted in them. So um, here's Lucy now, uh, the, well, Lucy at the time of the transplant, and here's Lucy now handing her models over to the Science Museum in London, um, and which she was very excited about. Um, and she's become a real ambassador for um, UK transplantation. And just to end really with a quote um, from uh, Michael Faraday, um, which I think is a very powerful aphorism for any innovation that we're gonna do for uh, patient care, um, still try, but who knows what is possible. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much again for the opportunity and I'd like to thank all my collaborators and, and team uh, for making this initiative possible. Thank you very much. Ankaj, uh, that was uh, absolutely superb. Thank you for sharing with us your pioneering experience. Can mm -hmm. we go to the uh, uh, mainframe, please, uh, Raj? Uh, yes, yeah, Ankaj, stop share screening and then that'll come back. So, uh, uh, Pankaj, uh, tell us uh, one of the challenges with uh, such pioneering technology is uh, scaling it, i.e. 
how is the regular surgeon going to use it? So are there newer materials, quicker and cheaper printing processes that mm. are becoming available uh, so that such technology can be used by most surgeons? Yes, that's a very good question. So I think that the perception that 3D printing is very expensive, takes a lot of time and it's quite complex. Um, the actual fundamental process of creating these models has not changed for 40 years. And as you're alluding to, it's just a matter of how we tweak the different stages to make it more efficient. Um, there's lots of great work going on um, in the Department of Medical Physics to try and improve the software um, and the algorithms for image segmentation, almost to develop an AI type system where you can actually um, process the, the image segmentation part quicker. Um, because as I said, that's where the most labor intense process um, actually is. Um, and certainly when we first started our program, it took almost um, maybe two weeks to get the image segmentation absolutely right and then check it with an in-house radiologist. So I think the workflow stream there has got potential for improvement um, and scaling up. Regarding materials, there are new materials coming out all the time. Um, in fact, I went to a 3D uh, conference last year only where we're getting a lot, a lot softer material now than the ones that we were initially using, which can perhaps simulate um, the actual um, human uh, tensile properties uh, of tissues much better. Um, and all in all, I think the drive is to create as realistic surgical environment as possible um, um, within, um, within a cost-effective um, uh, environment um, and in the most efficient, timely manner. I mean, with transplantation, it's difficult sometimes because we get offers of kidneys which are unpredictable in terms of timing. So um, it would be amazing if we could have a process by where we could 3D print the um, donor kidney here for, 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 for the deceased donor. Um, and, 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 and ship it across to us, and then we can plan the implantation before the kidneys even arrive to us. At the moment, it's restricted to only being planned living donor transplant. Um, so that's really the next step for us. Thank you, Pankaj. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, and mm -hmm. to uh, wrap up the session, uh, I want to introduce uh, uh, one of the most uh, gifted surgeons I have ever met, uh, Francesco Porpilia from uh, Torino. He's also the editor of Minerva. And uh, really, every time I have been to Turin, it's not just about the food, it's also about enjoying operating with him to tell us about hyper accurate 3D imaging and its real translation into the operating room. I give you Francesco Portpilia. Hey, thank you, Broker. Thank you for the invitation on in this uh, in very interesting conversation about the future of the robotic surgery. And so I, now I try to share on my presentation. And uh, my talk today is uh, obviously about uh, the 3D, augmented reality, and so the application of the 3D virtual uh, the printing of uh, this, uh, this new technology and then, uh, during, and the, during surgery and the, during the planning of surgery. As you know, the hyper-accurate imaging, I think, is one of the most important points in this moment because we are living a new era this year, on this on the a 3D uh, reconstruction of the surgery era, because on the, as you know, it's very important, especially during a uro-oncological surgery, it's very important to respect and uh, to obtain uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, good uh, functional and the oncological out outcomes. Because and I think that uh, functional uh, oncological outcomes, I think that in this moment, uh, they, say, uh, they have the same importance. And uh, in order to obtain uh, these uh, uh, results, uh, I think that the new technology can allow us uh, to support uh, the, to, uh, the, the possibility uh, to obtain this technology. And moreover, uh, we have the possibility uh, to uh, the planning if we want uh, the, uh, the planning uh, the, the, uh, our surgery and the two can the perform uh, the one personalized uh, the surgical in the intervention. As you know, from the, the uh, 2D imaging have some limits, in my opinion, because uh, the tradition of the uh, 2D imaging are utilized uh, for preoperative planning uh, and for intraoperative decision making. Nevertheless, during uh, intraoperative decision making, I think that the 
uh, surgeons is involved in uh, the building process mine in order uh, to obtain, uh, to imagine the imaging of uh, the CT scan, for example, the orientation of the organ. And this, in my opinion, could be a very important limitation because the surgeons is involved, first of all, in order to prevent the complication, is involved in the, in the, during the operation, is don't need to imagine what he have to do. So in order to overcome this limitation, I think that the 3D reconstruction can permit us the possibility to have a good guidance during the procedure. And as you know, in the past, the 3D modeling can be very performed with the 3D rendering, but the quality of the imaging that were produced by the by the, 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 the machine, by the software, were, were not excellent. And so I think that there were many limitations. Now we need to overcome this limitation. And this is possible thanks to the fact that we have a new professional software that allow to maximize the information. And so in this way, we can define, we can make the 3D high definition modeling. So how we have to make the kind of this kind of 3D, uh, 3D virtual models? So and I think that it's important to use kind of, some ingredients, so kind of, like a cake. So kind of, it's important to use kind of, multi-parametric MRI kind of, contrast enhancement with the one millimeter slices. The professional software kind of, should be authorized kind of, for medical use. And I think that in order to have a good segmentation, it's important not only to use kind of, the software, of uh, this second uh, uh, professional uh, uh, machine, but it's important to have uh, to define better uh, the characteristic of the lesions, the characteristic of the anatomy, thanks to the strict collaboration of the among bioengineers, urologists, and the radiologists. So uh, it's important at the end to have uh, the dedicated segmentation in order to emphasize the different anatomical structures. So if uh, the final products that we can made should be the following. So on the first of all, the possibility to visualize into division of the organs, but I think that we can, thanks to the transparency, thanks to the PDF on the reconstruction, the PDF on the PDF on the structures, we can visualize the different organs, the different component of the organs, like the neurovascular bundles for the prostate, the relationship between the between the tumor and the neurovascular bundles. So on the Thanks to kind of, this kind of, different kind of, possibility to make to kind of, build kind of, this kind of, new modeling, so kind of, we have the possibility to plan kind of, the best surgery for us. So at this point, how we can use the 3D models? I think that we have kind of, two possibility, two settings. The first of all, the first one is represented by the pre-operative planning. The second one is the intraoperative navigation. So kind of, Concerning the intraoperative on the planning, the preoperative planning. So on the we show already on the, with uh, many on the many papers on the we can the clearly show that on the uh, when we apply on the, the 3D planning on the, in the, for a partial nephrectomy, for example, on the we can have the possibility to change on the to uh, the indication on the for nephron sparing uh, surgery on the, in uh, about on the. 30% of cases, so it means that we can move from the, from the partial nephrectomy to, from a radical nephrectomy to partial nephrectomy at least in more than 20% of patients. So in our experience, when we change the indication from 47 to 75%. So it means that the possibility to have the 3D modeling before the operation, not only when we can plan the operation, but also we can change also the indication. And Concerning the Padua score, for example, we have the possibility to have a reclassification of the complexity of the tumor. And in our experience, that was, was published in the BJU, as you know, 50% of our patients to have the reduction of a Padua score or renal score. So it means that many patients that were classified and were candidate, for example, for radical nephrectomy or for a complex partial nephrectomy, now when they can switch thanks to this technology can from complex procedures to a simple procedures. So I think that the photo surgeons is very important to have a new, a good approach to this type of surgery. 
concerning again, the, the application of, of this technology again, for again, the radical prostatectomy, again, for example, again, the, we need to show in this again, the publication or that is better again, the, to have again, the good management of an ever-sparing approach. And so we improve the quality of uh, our, uh, our, uh, our uh, never-sparing procedure. And moreover, again, the concerning again, the, uh, this uh, technology, again, we have the possibility, again, for example, to show and also on the patients uh, to increase the feedback on the, with, the pa with the patients, uh, on the, with the counseling of patients before the operation. So on the, when we do on the, when a preoperative planning, on the, we can utilize on the three virtual modeling on the, in different manner. First of all, on the, one of the most important application could be on the, the possibility to use on the mix of the reality because of the, we can like, on the, transform on the, the 3D on the modeling in holograms. And thanks to on the HoloLens, we can visualize on the better on the, we, we can have on the 3D visualization and we can study better the modeling in every side. And all the tales can, they can be in the studies before on doing the operation. This is a typical example like on the, in which on the, we, have, we can have on the one application, especially on the, for partial nephrectomy. As you can see, we can go on the round, the, kind of the, we can turn around the, the, the kidney, we can turn around the, kind of the vascularization and the second you can see in the single branch that they supply, you know, they can they supply you know, the, the, the tumor on the second we can plan better on the hour on the type of on the play, uh, clamping artery. We can define if it's good you know, for us you know, to plan you know, the uh, uh, clamping of you know, the main artery, you know, we can clamp you know, selectively you know, only one branch or you know, two branches you know, that to supply you know, the area where the tumor is you know, located. So you know, we we show on the exactly when the word is second the importance of this second the planning on the operative planning during on the partial nephrectomy because on the we clearly show in this paper that was published in moon so that is the this second the, 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 the preoperative planning on the law on the better again the evaluation of recession technique so on the we can improve the percentage of patients that they can do on the nucleation instead of on the partial nephrectomy and a better evaluation of clamping so on the, you can define better on the, if you can do on the, the clamping of main artery on those selective clamping so this is a very important point so on the, in the future when I think that we can on the create on the one hololens that can be projected on the long the body of the patients and so on at this point we can define the sac like where the choker and should be in the place in order to plan better on the, our surgery on the, before doing on the partial nephrectomy, for example. But I think the many, a very, very important point is on the intraoperative navigation. Concerning the intraoperative navigation, we can have two types of application. The first application could be in the fora during the radical prostatectomy in order to identify better the tumor, to modulate our neurosafe procedure. Otherwise, we can identify better if we want during partial nephrectomy the tumor especially if the tumor is located inside the, the kidney. So in our experience, we applied the, the radical, this technology you know, during radical prostatectomy, for example, in, uh, with a rigid manner. Like, in this paper like, the published in BJU, we show clearly that like, this like, the static and like, the super like, imposition allow us like, the sacred, like, to identify like, where the tumor like, is located. And so like, we show like, clearly like, that in 100% of cases, like, we show on the correct identification of the tumor. Moreover, on the we identify in the second in 73.3% the positive surgical margins along the neurovascular boundaries when we perform on the biopsy because on the, the patients that were included in this study were patients with the extra on the extra capsule on the invasion and the, in which when the, we did the, on the uh, neuro on the um, uh, neurovascular on the preservation and after 
on the weekend, the complete calendarization of the bundles and the second we have identified with the witness a clip where the tumor was exactly located. So this technology can allow us exactly to, to identify the tumors. And in this study, for the first time, we show the, not only the feasibility, but also the efficacy of the, this technology in the identification of the tumors. But as you know, during the radical prostatectomy, we do some attraction, we bend the prostate, so the organ is not rigid. This is the reason why we invent the new technology that is second the elastic models in order to adapt second the models and the traction that we do during the operation. And again, with this 3D, 3D dimensional elastic and augmented reality, we show that it's possible to identify the tumors during the dynamic phase. So, during the, the session of the neurovascular bundles. And the so on, it was second, exactly and clearly and shown that in 100% of cases, when we identify exactly where the tumor was located and where the tumor was second, close, second, infiltrate the neurovascular bundles. So on, this technology is very effective also in this, in this, second, in this situation where when we do the dissection, the dissection of the neurovascular bundles. But as you can do, we can have an application of this technology during, for example, the partial nephrectomy. And so I think that in this paper, for example, we show that 3D reconstruction allowed to perform selective clamping with the potential effect of ischemia induced damage. And in our experience, this technology can allow to when we planning the operation, we we exactly maintain the indication in 90% of the cases because if you have a plan that the selective clamping, we maintain this planning in 90% of our patients. But I think that the one of the most important applications is this one. So the augmented reality can be can be applied in the obviously when the tumor is completely located inside the kidney. So at this level, for example, so at this point, we can have like, on the superimposed imaging. Thanks to this uh, superimposed imaging, we can like, on the exactly can identify where the tumor is located. And we study, like, we compare like, the results, the incision that we have made, also on the, with the ultrasound in the same patients, like, on the, we show clearly on the, that the, we have like, on the, exactly, exactly like, the, the, the identification of the area. The, with the ultrasound and with the, the uh, augmented reality. But uh, the augmented reality, in my opinion, uh, can have uh, some advantages in comparison to the ultrasound. What is the advantage? The advantage is uh, clearly shown in the next video. Now, on the, I'd like to show in this video on the, how on the incision was made in the imperfect way and how we can do on that during, uh, we can do on the enucleation of the tumor. So on the, we have clamped in this case, not only the artery, but also the vein, and the second exactly, on the, we can like, dissect the, the tumor, like, on the, moreover, on the, we can identify also on the calyx that are like, on the, uh, close, like, they, they are like, on the relationship with the tumor. And this anatomy can, it was like, clearly shown by like, the trade and the reconstruction that was uh, superimposed during the surgery. So this second, like, uh, uh, very like, the guidance surgery, like, on the so on, this is a very, very, very important, uh, very important technology, and especially for uh, some like, the special tumor like this one. But I think that, uh, as you know, during, uh, the, during uh, the reconstructive phase, uh, I think that ultrasound are not useful. Instead, I think that the augmented reality, uh, the augmented reality is very useful. Why it is useful? Because if we, we superimpose the imaging, uh, so especially the vasculature of the, the kidney, uh, we can perform uh, exactly the suture uh, along the vessels exactly the mouth of the, the, the vessel we can close selectively like, without involving like, the big vessels, like, the intraparenchymal vessels during the suture. Like, so we can in this way not only prevent in injury of the kidney, a failure, renal failure like, in the post-operative stake, like, but also like, we can like, prevent like, the risk to have like, the, um, the, uh, an aneurysm like, the fistula like, between like, the, uh, the, uh, the artery like, and the vein because the suture can be performed selectively. 
This is a very big advantage that we recorded in our experience. And as you can see at the end, when we can complete our suture with the big needle, like on the which when we involve only the cortical, but the medulla was closed selectively. So on the what is the advantages of this technology? Well, this technology can work and clearly show the advantages in this paper and which we show clearly that we have a more selective clamping and more enucleation, less post-operative surgery related complication, a better functional outcomes of the operated kidney. In when we compare the, 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 the partial nephrectomy in which we utilize ultrasound, standard technique versus on patients in which when we utilize, utilize also only can they augment the reality. So it means the big advantages, especially in this setting of patients with the completely intrarenal tumors. But as you know, the tumor can be sometimes also located in the posterior phase of the kidney. So at this point, when we need to mobilize the kidney, and sometimes when we need to mobilize completely, to medialize completely the kidney in order to identify the tumor. Well, also in this case, thanks to the elastic modeling, we can identify and better the tumor during the step of medialization. So in this case, we can prevent the complete the mobilization of the kidney. We can confine the mobilization of the kidney only at the step in which we can do exactly the realization of the tumor, as is clearly shown in this video. So again, we have shown that the elastic model can be applied also during partial nephrectomy. But I think this is the very new, the innovation that we have introduced because up to now, we utilize the, the semi-automatic modeling because usually during the surgery, I am helped by my assistant. Instead, we can have the possibility to, to utilize, to employ the new technology. So that this technology that we have can create in the last few months has been the following. We can introduce the catheter, the catheter, the catheter at this catheter automatically, the imaging can be anchored, can anchor automatically. And so at this point, you can visualize exactly where the tumor is located because we can remove the different part of the prostate, the surface of the prostate, and the second we can do on the exactly kind of the recession of the bundle with with the aim kind of to modulate obviously kind of the our kind of recession and kind of to preserve kind of if it is possible one certain quantity of nerves. So on the way again when kind of we repeat kind of the same study that we have made kind of in the in the past when kind of we reach the modeling and we show kind of also kind of with this technique in the first few cases that we have made exactly the same concordance on the between the tumor where on the, the images were projected and the histological examination, the histological findings. So this is a promising technique and I think that we are investing now on in this technology on the, for on the performing on the, uh, better on the uh, uh, neurovascular bundle preservation on the, the neurosaverization. So well, this is my take on message. In the last years, I think that the new hyperacute three models allow a more precise surgical planning. With holograms, I think that we have kind of the possibility to visualize better the organs because we can like, on the, see like, on the, all details, like, on the special of the vasculatures. I think that the augmented reality show great potential application improve like, the outcomes like, on the, in our daily practice. Like, on this, uh, this is what we are experiencing in uh, our institution. And I think that the, we are entering in a new era. The era is of augmented reality, uh, driving by kind of, the artificial intelligence that allow kind of, the automatically kind of, the possibility to identify exactly kind of, where the tumor is kind of, kind of, located. Thank you so much kind of, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Uh, uh, that was uh, quite astonishing. Uh, seeing where we are going with this kind of image guided surgery. One final question from uh, Raj Nair. Raj? Francesco, thank you so much for that talk. It was uh, wonderful, enlightening, and clearly you can see how this is going to influence uh, robotics in the future. Uh, my question is really around the data that is put in because 
clearly what you generate is as good as the scan that you input. And I wonder whether you have perhaps a question for both of yourself and Pankaj. Um, you're only as good as the data that you put in. And so therefore, have you got a number of minimum thresholds in terms of the quality of CT scanning, the quality of MRI? I ask this because we have some excellent quality scanning um, uh, scanners here at uh, our local unit guys in St. Thomas's. And yet, even when you look at those patients where you have a PUJ obstruction and you think there is no crossing vessel and intraoperatively you find it, these are clearly going to be missed on a 3D scanner. I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, I, I think that it's uh, very important to have like, in the CT scan like, in the before the operation that it should be made of, of high quality. They're very, very thin. And I think that the best quality should be about like, the, not uh, uh, more than uh, one millimeter because the slices, the information that uh, the software uh, should be received, they should be very, very high. Moreover, and I think that the, show, uh, the software should be helped at the end in order to the, the refine better the images. I think that it should be helped by uh, the human, the hands of the bioengineers in order to refine better uh, the images, in order to define better uh, the uh, the limits between the tumor and the, 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 the structures that are around, like, for example, the calyx, in order to establish it if there is an the involvement of the calyx or not. So and I think that in, my, in our experience, and it's very important to create one team. The team should be made by urologists, the radiologist, obviously that he needed to offer us second, the best imaging. And second, the bioengineers, the bioengineers, bioengineers obviously can be works with uh, the machine, with the softwares in order to create the, the 3D modelings. But I think that at the end, you need to define, to refine better the images, thanks to the collaboration, the collaboration of, between the bioengineers and, uh, and uh, the urologists. At the end, I think that you obtain uh, the good images, excellent images. The images that I show today are the results of this collaboration. It's not only made by the software, by it, this, the, results of the, the software and the human intervention. Final word from uh, Pankaj. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good question, Rajesh. And uh, I agree with uh, Professor Francesco, actually. And uh, I think uh, the rate limiting step in all this is the quality of the images. And, um, but, but also, in my experience, what's important is um, the, the dialogue, the communication between um, the, the medical physics team, the radiologist, uh, and the clinical team. This is actually really, really important. And because we've got to all make sure that we're on the same page. And we, you know, the, radio, the, the medical physics team want to understand what we want as clinicians uh, in the model. And if that dialogue is missed or misinterpreted, um, then they will, um, you know, that could affect the, mo the, you know, the, the, the model itself. The other thing is we've got two uh, radiologists um, that interpret the scans and sit with the medical physics team to do the image segmentation. And I think that's an important point because it helps with their learning curve um, and interpretation um, because this is a new, inverted commas, a new skill, if you like. And therefore, it's, it's, it's important not to have too many people um, doing this sort of processing. I think it's important to have the same people uh, to generate that learning curve, that experience, as with any surgical technique, really. Uh, it, it's the same with endovascular stenting and EVAR planning for vascular surgery. Um, you know, it, it, it requires a, a standard team approach. Um, and I think the critical thing is to combine them all in a multidisciplinary environment. Um, if the images are not good, Rajesh, then we will simply ask them to have them repeated, um, if that's the case. Um, what's important is the model has to, has to accurately capture what's in the images and, and what we want. Um, and that depends on you know, the complexity of the case. It's slightly different in transplantation where we're putting an organ into another body cavity as opposed to removing <laughs> bits of tissue, if you like, from organs, which is what Professor Francesco is doing. Um, so it's a slightly different uh, approach uh, in thinking. Gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. You have really uh, shown us and the audience uh, where the future lies. Uh, it's so nice to see that the images that we actually produce before the operation can be used during the operation rather than just lie on a computer screen. So uh, that really is amazing. I thank you so much uh, for your kind contributions and wish you a very nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you.